Good day and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Capital One Q2 2024 earnings call. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Jeff Norris, Senior Vice President of Finance. Please go ahead. Thanks very much, Josh, and welcome everyone to Capital One's second quarter 2024 earnings conference call. As usual, we are webcasting live over the internet. To access the call on the internet, please log on to Capital One's website at CapitalOne.com and follow the links from there. In addition to the press release and the financials, we've included a presentation summarizing our second quarter 2024 results. With me this evening are Mr. Richard Fairbank, Capital One's Chief, uh, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, and Mr. Andrew Young, Capital One's fin Chief Financial Officer. Rich and Andrew will walk you through the presentation. To access a copy of the presentation and press release, please go to Capital One's website, click on Investors, then click on Quarterly Earnings Release. Please note that this presentation may contain forward-looking statements. Information regarding Capital One's financial performance and any forward-looking statements contained in today's discussion in the materials. Speak only as of the particular date or dates indicated in the materials. Capital One does not undertake any obligation to update or revise any of this information whether as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise. Numerous factors could cause our actual results to differ materially from those described in forward-looking statements. And for more information on these factors, please see the section titled Forward-Looking Information in the Earnings Release Presentation and the Risk Factors section in our annual and quarterly reports accessible at the Capital One website and filed with the SEC. And with that done, I'll turn the call over to Mr. Young. Andrew? Thanks, Jeff, and good afternoon, everyone. I will start on slide three of tonight's presentation. In the second quarter, Capital One earned $597 million, or $1.38 per diluted common share. Included in the results for the quarter were adjusting items related to the Walmart partnership termination, Discover integration costs, and an accrual for our updated estimate of the FDIC's special assessment. Net of these adjusting items, second quarter earnings per share were $3.14. Relative to the prior quarter, period end loans held for investment increased 1%, while average loans were flat. Ending deposits were flat versus last quarter, while average deposits increased 1%. Our percentage of FDIC insured deposits increased one percentage point to 83% of total deposits. Pre-provision earnings in the second quarter increased 7% from the first quarter. Revenue in the linked quarter increased 1% driven by higher net and non-interest income, while non-interest expense decreased 4% driven by a decline in operating expense. Our provision for credit losses was $3.9 billion in the quarter. The $1.2 billion increase in provision relative to the prior quarter was almost entirely driven by higher allowance. Included in the second quarter was an $826 million allowance build from the elimination of the loss sharing provisions that occurred within the termination of the Walmart partnership. The remaining quarter over quarter provision increase was driven by a $353 million higher net reserve build, and a $28 million increase in net charge-offs. Turning to slide four, I will cover the allowance in greater detail. We built $1.3 billion in allowance this quarter. The allowance balance now stands at $16.6 billion. Our total portfolio coverage ratio increased 35 basis points to 5.23%. The increase in this quarter's allowance and coverage ratio was largely driven by a build in our card segment. I'll cover the drivers of the changes in allowance and coverage ratio by segment on slide five. In our domestic card business, the allowance coverage ratio increased by 69 basis points to 8.54%. The substantial majority of the increase in coverage was driven by the impact of the termination of the Walmart loss sharing agreement. In our consumer banking segment, the allowance decreased by $23 million 
resulting in a five basis point decrease to the coverage ratio. And finally, our commercial banking allowance increased by $6 million. Coverage ratio remained essentially flat at 1.74%. Turning to page six, I'll now discuss liquidity. Total liquidity reserves in the quarter decreased about $5 billion to approximately $123 billion. Our cash position ended the quarter at approximately $45 billion, down about $6 billion from the prior quarter. The decrease was driven by wholesale funding maturities, loan growth, and declines in our commercial deposits, partially offset by deposit growth in our retail banking business. You can see our preliminary average liquidity coverage ratio during the second quarter was 155%, down from 164% in the first quarter. Turning to page seven, I'll cover our net interest margin. Our second quarter net interest margin was 6.7%, one basis point higher than last quarter and 22 basis points higher than the year ago quarter. The relatively flat quarter-over-quarter NIM was the result of largely offsetting factors. NIM in the quarter benefited from the termination of the revenue sharing agreement with Walmart, as well as modestly higher yields in the auto business. These two factors were roughly offset by the seasonal effects on yield in the card portfolio and a slight increase in the rate paid on retail deposits. Turning to slide eight, I will end by discussing our capital position. Our common equity tier one capital ratio ended the quarter at 13.2%, 10 basis points higher than the prior quarter. Net income in the quarter was largely offset by the impact of dividends and $150 million of share repurchases. During the quarter, the Federal Reserve released the results of their stress test. Our preliminary stress capital buffer requirement is 5.5%, resulting in a CET1 requirement of 10%. However, as we disclosed in our last 10Q, the announcement of the acquisition of Discover constituted a material business change. As a result, we are subject to the Federal Reserve's pre-approval of our capital actions until the merger approval process has concluded. With that, I will turn the call over to Rich. Rich? Thanks, Andrew, and uh, good evening, everyone. Slide 10 shows second quarter results in our credit card business. Credit card segment results are largely a function of our domestic card results and trends, which are shown on slide 11. In the second quarter, our domestic card business delivered another quarter of strong results as we continued to invest in flagship products and exceptional customer experiences to grow our franchise. Year-over-year purchase volume growth for the quarter was 5%. Ending loan balances increased $11.1 billion, or about 8% year-over-year. Average loans also increased about 8%. And second quarter revenue was up 9%, driven by the growth in purchase volume and loans. Revenue margin for the quarter remained strong at 17.9%. The revenue margin includes a positive impact of about 18 basis points resulting from the partial quarter effect of the end of the Walmart revenue sharing agreement. The charge-off rate for the quarter was 6.05%. The partial quarter impact of the end of the Walmart loss sharing agreement increased the quarterly charge-off rate by 19 basis points. Excluding this impact, the the charge-off rate for the quarter would have been 5.86 percent, up 148 basis points year over year. The 30-plus delinquency rate at quarter end was 4.14 percent, up 40 basis points from the prior year. As a reminder, the end of the Walmart loss sharing agreement did not have a meaningful impact on delinquency rates. The pace of year-over-year increases in both the charge-off rate and the delinquency rate have been steadily declining for several quarters and continued to shrink in the second quarter. 
on a sequential quarter basis, the charge off rate excluding the Walmart impact was down eight basis points and the 30 plus delinquency rate was down 34 basis points. Domestic card non-interest expense was up 5% compared to the second quarter of 2023, primarily driven by higher marketing expense. Total company marketing expense in the quarter was $1.1 billion, up 20% year over year. Our choices in domestic card are the biggest driver of total company marketing. We continue to see compelling growth opportunities in our domestic card business. Our marketing continues to deliver strong new account growth across the domestic card business. Compared to the second quarter of 2023, Domestic card marketing in the quarter included increased marketing to grow originations at the top of the marketplace, higher media spend, and increased investment in differentiated customer experiences like our travel portal, airport lounges, and Capital One shopping. Slide 12 shows second quarter results for our consumer banking business. After returning to positive growth last quarter, auto originations were up 18% year over year in the second quarter. Consumer banking ending loans were down $1.6 billion or 2% year over year, and average loans were down 3%. On a linked quarter basis, ending loans were up 1% and average loans were flat. Compared to the year ago quarter, ending consumer deposits were up about 7% and average deposits were up 5%. Consumer banking revenue for the quarter was down about 9% year over year, largely driven by higher deposit costs and lower average loans compared to the prior year quarter. Non-interest expense was up about 2% compared to the second quarter of 2023, driven by an increase in marketing to support our national digital bank. The auto charge-off rate for the quarter was 1.81%, up 41 basis points year over year. The 30-plus delinquency rate was 5.67%, up 29 basis points year over year, largely as the result of our choice to tighten credit and pull back in 2022. Auto charge-offs have been strong and stable. Slide 13 shows second quarter results for our commercial banking business. Compared to the linked quarter, ending loan balances decreased about 1%. Average loans were also down about 1%. The modest declines are largely the result of choices we made in 2023 to tighten credit. Ending deposits were down about 6% from the linked quarter. Average deposits were down about 3%. The declines are largely driven by our continued choices to manage down selected, less attractive commercial deposit balances. Second quarter revenue was essentially flat from the linked quarter and non-interest expense was lower by about 6%. The commercial banking annualized net charge off rate for the second quarter increased two basis points from the sequential quarter to 0.15%. The commercial banking criticized performing loan rate was 8.62%, up 23 basis points compared to the linked quarter. The criticized non-performing loan rate increased 18 basis points to 1.46%. In closing, we continued to deliver strong results in the second quarter. We delivered another quarter of top line growth in domestic card loans, purchase volume and revenue, and a second consecutive quarter of year over year growth in auto origination. Consumer credit trends continued to show stability and our operating efficiency ratio improved. We had guided to 2024 annual operating efficiency ratio net of adjustments to be flat to modestly down compared to 2023, assuming the CFPB late fee rule takes effect in October 
and we're on a very consistent path with what we expected when we gave that guidance. If the implementation of the rule is delayed, that would be a tailwind to 2024 annual operating efficiency ratio. One thing that has changed is the Walmart relationship. Our partnership ended in the second quarter, which will increase charge-off rates, but have a positive impact on operating efficiency ratio. Including the Walmart impact, we expect full year 2024 operating efficiency ratio net of adjustments to be modestly down compared to 2023. We continue to lean into marketing to grow and to further strengthen our franchise. In the domestic card business, we continue to get traction and originations across our products and channels, and our origination opportunities are enhanced by our technology transformation, which enables us to leverage machine learning at scale to identify the most attractive growth opportunities and customize our marketing offers. We're also getting traction in building our franchise at the top of the market with heavy spenders. It is not lost on us that competitive intensity and marketing levels are increasing at the very top of the market, and we know we have important investments to make. We continue to be pleased to see our investments pay off in customer and spend growth and returns and we're building an enduring franchise with annuity-like revenue streams, very low losses, and very low attrition. In consumer banking, our modern technology and leading digital capabilities are powering our digital-first national banking strategy, and we're leaning even harder into marketing to grow our national checking franchise, which has had um, industry-leading pricing with no fees and industry-leading customer satisfaction. Pulling up, marketing is a key driver of current and future growth and value creation across the company, and we're leaning hard into our marketing investments. We expect total company marketing in the second half of 2024 to be meaningfully higher than the first half, similar to the pattern we saw last year. We are all in and working hard to complete the Discover acquisition. Our applications for regulatory approval are in process, and we're fully mobilized to plan and deliver a successful integration. We continue to expect that we'll be in a position to complete the acquisition late this year or early next year, subject to regulatory and shareholder approval. The combination of Capital One and Discover creates game-changing strategic opportunities. The Discover Payments Network positions Capital One as a more diversified, vertically integrated global payments platform. And adding Capital One's debit spending and a growing portion of our credit card purchase volume to the Discover Network will add significant scale, increasing the network's value to merchants, small businesses, and consumers and driving enhanced network growth. In credit cards and consumer banking, we're bringing together proven franchises with complementary strategies and a shared focus on the customer. And we will be able to leverage and scale the benefits of our 11-year technology transformation across every business and the network. Pulling way up, the acquisition of Discover is a singular opportunity it will create a consumer banking and global payments platform with unique capabilities, modern technology, powerful brands, and a franchise of more than 100 million customers. It delivers compelling financial results and offers the potential to create significant value for merchants and customers. And now we'll be happy to answer your questions. Jeff? Thanks, Rich. We'll now start the Q&A session. As a courtesy to other investors and analysts who may wish to ask a question, please limit yourself to one question plus a single follow-up. If you have any follow-up questions after the Q&A session, the investor relations team will be available after the call. Josh, please start the Q&A. Thank you. To ask a question, please press star 1-1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. 
To withdraw your question, please press star 1-1 one, one again. One moment for questions. Our first question comes from Sanjay Sakrani with KBW. You may proceed. Thanks. Um, uh, Rich Andrews, just looking at the credit metrics, as Rich mentioned, it seems like the trends are pretty favorable. I mean, uh, in most segments, things are improving, if not stable. And then U.S. card, there's an improving trend in that second derivative. I'm just curious how we should think about reserve rate going forward, because I think even excluding the Walmart impact, the reserve rate went higher. Sure, Sanjay. Um, well, let me start by covering this quarter's allowance, and then I'll talk about the, the future. So in the quarter, as you said, you know, first we had the effect of Walmart, the $826 million bill that we uh, spelled out as an adjusting item. We also reserved for the growth we saw in the, the quarter. You know, beyond that, coverage in card, as you referenced, grew, uh, I think it was just over 10 basis points, which is a little over 1% of, of the allowance balance. And so as part of that process each quarter, not only are we you know, rolling forward our, our baseline forecast, uh, but we're also looking at you know, a range of macroeconomic and consumer behavior uncertainties including, you know, things like the changing seasonal customer behavior we talked about last quarter. And so as a result, in this quarter, we increased the qualitative factors to reflect those uh, uncertainties, and that's what drove the modest increase in, in coverage this quarter. As I look ahead and, you know, talking uh, conceptually here, but in a period where projected loss rates in, in future quarters are projected to, to stabilize and, and ultimately decline and might indicate a decline in the, the coverage ratio, I would say you could very well see a coverage ratio that, you know, remains flat for some period of time as, as we incorporate the uncertainty uh, of, of those future projections into the allowance. And, you know, in a period where forecasted losses are rising, you know, we're, we're quick to incorporate uh, those higher forecasted losses and also potentially add qualitative factors for uncertainty, like you saw early in the pandemic. But I would say uh, it is unlikely to be symmetric on uh, on the way down. And so, you know, eventually the projected, uh, you know, stabilizing and, and ultimately lower losses will flow through the allowance um, particularly as the uncertainties uh, around that forecast become more certain. But, you know, at this point, I'm not going to be uh, in the business of, of forecasting uh, when that's actually going to take place for us. Got it. And then, Rich, maybe you could just talk about um, the consumer and sort of the uncertainties there. Is there any discernible, like, change that you've seen since the last quarter in terms of the state of the consumer? We've obviously seen the spending trend sort of slow somewhat across the industry. Uh, but anything else to sort of point out? Uh, Sanjay, I think uh, what we see is uh, is something that's very uh, uh, stable. You know, the, the U.S. consumer remains a source of strength in the, in the overall economy. Of course, the labor market remains uh, strikingly resilient. Uh, rising incomes have kept uh, consumer debt servicing burdens relatively low by historical standards despite high interest rates. You know, when we look at our customers, you know, we see that on average they have higher bank balances than before the pandemic, and this is cr uh, true across income levels. You know, on the other hand, inflation shrank real incomes for almost two years, and we've only recently seen real wage growth uh, turn positive again. Um, and, you know, in, in this high interest rate environment, the cost of new borrowing has gone up in every major asset class, mortgages, auto loans, and credit cards. So we'll obviously keep an eye on that. And I think at the margin, these effects are almost certainly stretching some consumers financially. But on the whole, I, I think, I'd say consumers are in reasonably good shape relative to most uh, historical benchmarks. And, uh, you know, the, the, as, as our 
uh, credit numbers came in uh, month to by in. month. The person you're trying uh, to reach is not available. It, At the tone, it, please record your message. When you have finished I'm recording, sorry, you may uh, hang can up. You, can you hear me? Can you still hear me? Uh, you can hear me. Okay, I, I just had some cross the message uh, coming in on my phone, but um, the uh, but but with with respect to credit, we were uh, very pleased with the credit performance in the quarter. You know, we had uh, we had talked a, a bit about uh, seasonality. Maybe people want to ask question about that. Uh, but but we we saw uh, basically pulling up. We we see things settling out nicely. Uh, in the card business, and their things are very strong in the auto business. Thank you. Our next question, question please. comes from here, Batia with Bank of America. You may proceed. Hi, uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, maybe uh, just turning to Nim for a second. Uh, you know, with the Fed or at least expectations for rate cuts coming into view. Can you just comment on the current backdrop for deposit competition? How do you ex And how do you expect deposit betas to trend during the early stages of the Fed rate cutting cycle? Sure, Mahir. Like what we've seen, at least uh, within our walls, and you saw it, the evidence of it this quarter, in uh, a quarter where Seasonally, you typically see a decline in deposit uh, balances. Looking at H8 data, uh, we saw a few, I think it was $4 billion of, of growth. We've been quite pleased uh, over the course of the last couple of years with all of the investments uh, we've made over many years in building a deposit franchise and are, are certainly uh, benefiting uh, from that. And so with respect to the beta going forward, you know, first looking at what we saw in the, the up cycle here, you know, the, the total uh, cumulative beta that we've seen in this cycle this quarter, I think cumulatively was 62%. Um, and so uh, assuming uh, that the Fed's next move is to uh, bring rates down, it's hard to precisely predict what's going to happen to deposit costs and, and therefore betas, um, and in particular the pace of those declines because, you know, market dynamics, competitive pricing actions, other actions related to uh, companies looking to potentially preserve uh, NIM, that's going to, to drive uh, betas in the, the future. Cycle, but you know, I, I think you get a pretty good sense for our our pricing and mix based on what you saw in the up cycle and within that backdrop that I just described. That's going to influence what happens to our our beta on the way down. All right, <clears throat> so that's helpful. Thank you. And then just um, switching back to the health of the customer mm -hmm. overall. Um, as you look up across your portfolio, you know we've heard a little bit of talk about pull people pulling back, particularly on discretionary spend and low-income cohorts, et cetera. Is that a, a dynamic you are also seeing when you look at your customer base? And then relatedly, you know, Rich mentioned uh, how pleased he is with the progress you're making on the higher income side, if you will, on the big, on the transactor in that, in that high-end high transactor balance side. Uh, I was just wondering, how does that change your portfolio as you think about it, like over the next few years, like, you know, as you grow that book further? Uh, yes. Um, well, uh, thank you so much. Just with respect to uh, spending, you know, we see pretty proportional uh, movements in um, discretionary versus non-discretionary. Uh, spending, nothing really striking there when we look at the uh, portfolio spending uh, metrics. You know, the spend, the spend per customer is really pretty uh, flat. You know, when, when you see spend growth at a company like uh, Capital One, the purchase volume growth is really being driven by, uh, you know, the new accounts. So um, things are really pretty uh, stable, flat and stable, healthy, um, but but pretty flat uh, on a per customer basis. 
Uh, with respect to the question about the uh, the gradual transition of our portfolio to a higher end uh, customer, uh, let me just pull up and talk about that. We have, you know, for for decades, been a company that uh, sort of uh, serves the mass market, really from the the top of the credit spectrum uh, through to. Um, you know, even down to uh, some subprime uh, customers. And we have continued very consistently with this strategy. Probably the most striking thing, though, that's happened over the last 10 or 14 years, I guess 14 years ago, is when we launched the Venture Card. We have uh, systematically leaned into going after uh, the top of the market, not leaving the other behind, but really as an additive strategy and uh, and we have continued uh, through our marketing and through the products that we're offering to just keep moving higher and higher uh, in terms of the target customers and the traction that we're getting. And by the way, we continue, even as we're growing purchase volume overall, where we see the highest growth rates in purchase volume are as we go uh, higher in the market. So we're very happy about that. Um, and when we think about the portfolio effects um, that happen there, this is one thing that we see is that uh, payment rates have, uh, along that journey, gone up quite a bit at Capital One. And when we look to see our payment rates coming back to where they were pre-pandemic, they, they sort of, you know, they probably just aren't going to return all the way because that would be a reflection of the portfolio shift. We just in general have had the, the kind of mix shift that you'd expect with, um, you know, higher payment rates um, and a just uh, higher levels uh, of spend, higher spend rates. Uh, in in the business, and uh, that's been uh, very successful. So, but from an outstanding's point of view, it doesn't the the top of the market uh, business doesn't have that much impact on outstandings because these uh, folks generally uh, pay in full. So, you know, when you see the the outstandings movement of Capital One, uh, it's pretty consistently driven by the mass uh, market part of our business. It's just that inside some of the portfolio metrics are moving because of the mixed shift toward more spenders. Thank Next you. question, please. Our next question comes from Rick Shane with JP Morgan. You may proceed. Thanks for taking my question this afternoon. Um, look, given the breadth of your reach across the consumer uh, income levels. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of any patterns that you're seeing? We've heard, for example, uh, some slowdown in spending for lower income consumers. Uh, I'm curious, um, particularly you'd made a comment earlier in the quarter about uh, an increase in minimum payment rates. I'm curious if you're seeing uh, anything in terms of payment behavior that we should consider uh, by income level. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's just pull up uh, for a minute on just talking about how the subprime consumer is holding up. So, you know, way back in the global financial crisis, uh, we observed that credit metrics in subprime moved earlier in both directions. Subprime, um, also worsened uh, less on a on a percentage basis than prime, but of course it it you know in in absolute deltas it still moved uh, more. In the pandemic, subprime credit moved more and more quickly than prime. It normalized more quickly and appears to be stable and appeared basically to stabilize sooner as well. And you know that's in the context of lower income consumers seeing disproportionate benefits of government aid 
and uh, you know forbearance on on financial products, and then the unwinding of that uh, over time. And so, subprime is of course not synonymous with lower income, although they're correlated, and we saw these effects across credit. Uh, you know, both in talking about the, the credit spectrum and also uh, the income gradients. So, um, you know, on the other hand, just a couple of other effects just on the credit side that have happened over the recent years. Subprime consumers have been subject to more industry credit supply, including fintech competition during and after the pandemic. So that's been something we've always uh, kept a close uh, eye on and, and uh, you know, worried about whether that, that was going to um, disproportionately impact the credit performance of, of subprime customers. I don't really, I, I mean, given, given the overall pretty strong performance in subprime, I, I think we haven't seen that effect too much. And another thing to, to point out is that income growth has been consistently higher for lower income consumers over the past several years. And this is the opposite of what we saw during and after the global financial crisis. Um, but, um, you know, while no two cycles alike are alike, I think, again, we're seeing that subprime consumers and lower lower income consumers, again, they're not the same thing, but they tend to move earlier, but not necessarily more than the overall market. Now, when you, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, payment rates. So, throughout the course of the pandemic, payment rates increased, not only for us, but across the industry. And more recently, payment rates have drifted down from pandemic highs um, as the effects of stimulus have waned. Um, and the payment rates generally, uh, we have seen this effect. So the effect that we've seen of payment rates going down relative to where they were <clears throat> you know, uh, one one to two years ago, relative to their peak, basically, um, in um, every part of our business, uh, they have come down, but are still um, above uh, where they were uh, pre-pan uh, pre-pandemic. And again, I think part of that is the mix effect that we talked about uh, in the prior question. There's a mix effect, not only across our whole portfolio, but even within the segments of our portfolio, we've just had more emphasis on the spender side versus the revolver side internally. And so I think uh, you see some of that showing up uh, in the metrics. <clears throat> One other thing I want to, I want to say is that, uh, talk about your your question about uh, minimum payments. So we have we have simultaneously we're sort of seeing an effect where payment rates, while they're going down, continue to be uh, well above uh, pre-pandemic levels, even as minimum the percentage of customers paying minimum payments. This, by the way, is not a subprime effect. This is a portfolio effect I'm talking about. The percent of customers paying minimum payments is also somewhat above pre-pandemic levels. Now, it's a, it seems a little odd to have both of those effects happening at the same time, but I think in many ways, this is a very natural way that normalization is happening. And you've heard us talk uh, for a long time now about what we call the delayed charge-off effect in uh, consumer credit that so many uh, customers um, got uh, stimulus and, and forbearance that I think a lot of people who otherwise would have charged off were able to uh, avoid that charge off. Many 
Uh, hopefully, we're able to permanently avoid that. But for some, we have believed it was more of a deferral of an inevitability and this phenomenon of delayed charge-offs, um, which can't be separately measured, we believe is, is um, you know, a driving factor behind uh, why credit has been settling out higher than pre-pandemic, because I think there's just a, um, a, a delayed charge-off effect for some of these customers who otherwise would have charged off earlier. And, and that, that then would be consistent with a very healthy consumer, payment rates generally even being higher um, than uh, pre-pandemic, but there is a tail of consumers paying, you know, a higher percentage on minimum payments and uh, some of them um, going through um, a charge off that might have otherwise happened a few years earlier. Next Thank question, you. please. Our next question comes from Ryan Nash with Goldman Sachs. You may proceed. <clears throat> hey, good afternoon, Rich. Uh, <clears throat> so um, m- maybe to ask about marketing. So I think your, the guide that you provided said around $2.6 billion roughly of marketing spend in the second half, and you talked a little bit about the competitive intensity in the top of the market is increasing. Can you maybe just talk about how much of the increase in marketing is being driven by the, you know, investing more to acquire more customers versus competition, pushing up the cost to acquire. And then just given what you just talked about around low-end consumers, are you pulling back and else anywhere, you know, to cover the, the increased cost of acquiring? Uh, Ryan, um, our, yeah, our comments about the uh, competitive intensity, let me just, uh, let me just elaborate a little bit more about that. The card business uh, is very uh, competitively intense, uh, you know, across uh, the spectrum. It's been consistently uh, intense. Uh, competition has, um, you know, competition in things like rewards have certainly heated up over the last uh, couple of years, um, and the the thing that I was pointing out is is just something that again is not something that is like the the, the realization of of the last month or so. It's it's a phenomenon we've seen from some for some time, but it is striking, which is at the very top of the market. Uh, we are seeing, um, you know, uh, for the you know, especially a couple of uh, competitors that we have the most intensely play at the very uh, top of the market. You can just absolutely see they are stepping up, investing more in lounges, in experiences, in dining, investing in companies, um, marketing levels. Um, you know, it's, 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 it, it, all, I'm, I'm sure all the investors can see it. We can all see it, and they talk about it. And uh, it's not lost on us that, um, you know, these are strong competitors, and we certainly, uh, you know, have, uh, um, you know, we, we, we already have had very important, you know, investment plans in these areas, and, and we note that uh, others are investing heavily, uh, too. So, um but with respect to the let me just now kind of pull up now and just talk about the uh, marketing sort of where we are from a marketing point of view uh, we can continue to see great opportunities and um, really across our businesses uh, we remain very excited about the success of our origination activities uh, especially in our card uh, products and channels, and of course, what's happening in the bank. Um, the, the, the two big areas that are driven by uh, marketing spend. You know, this continues to be powered by our technology transformation. And just to savor a little bit, because we often point at that, what, what, why does the technology transformation help here? It gives us the ability to leverage more and more data 
and machine learning models to identify the most attractive growth opportunities. And it allows us to increasingly tailor our solutions to, uh, you know, down to the individual customer uh, level to ensure that we're meeting them right where we are. So kind of the first point I would say, and key reason we're leaning into the marketing is we're getting a lot of traction and the, the, our tech uh, transformation is certainly uh, helping to uh, power more opportunities. Secondly, we continue to expand on our success in building a franchise at the top of the market and with heavy, heavy spenders and this quest. Well, for years we've been talking about, you know, going after the top of the market. Every year as we get more traction, we reach just a little bit higher. Uh, these customers are very attractive. In addition to the obvious spend growth, they generate strong revenue, very low losses, low attrition, and uh, the business helps uh, elevate our brand really across the company. Now, <clears throat> it's also something that, you know, we've known all along is that um, it's expensive and requires quite a bit of investment to build a business at the top of the market, you know, in the form of upfront costs and also in the form of a sustained commitment to customer benefits and experiences and, and building a brand. So, yeah, you have early spend bonuses that are an important cost of doing business. That shows up uh, in the marketing line item. Um, brand makes a huge difference. And brand, of course, requires a long-term commitment to build. Uh, and uh, as we continue to move up the, mar the market, uh, we are moving increasingly into areas where consumers are looking for exclusive services and experiences that aren't available in the general marketplaces, such as places such as airport lounges and access to select properties. And, um, and iconic experiences. So we've seen at the top of the market, our two biggest competitors really lean in here. And um, um, we, and, you know, and we certainly are leaning in as well. Uh, Ryan, I, I wouldn't, there, there are sometimes, there are sometimes I've seen over the years that marketing levels just rise. And so you just got to market more and more and more just to hold your own. And uh, I, don't, I don't feel that we're in an environment like this. I feel that the, the certainly competitive intensity is increasing. But when we're talking about in general in the card business where uh, competitive intensity is increasing a bit and, and specifically with respect to these investments at the top of the market, um, you know, these are just important things that you have to build to win at the top of the market, but we are very pleased with the traction we're getting, the, um, the economics of our heavy spender business. Um, and uh, so uh, this is, uh, you know, we just, it's just not lost on us. Uh, a couple of our other competitors are very focused on the same thing. So we continue to lean into growth here, both in, in terms of upfront customer acquisition and our ongoing investment in brand and exclusive experiences um, uh, and, uh, and benefits. Now, let me now turn to the third part of our marketing story, which is our investment in building our national bank. So this has been a journey that we've been on for many, many years. Um, when we bought ING Direct, Direct way back in 2012, we said this is going to be not only a great financial acquisition, but it's going to be a transformational strategic uh, acquisition because now as a player with a significant branch network and a national direct bank, we have the building blocks to build a unique national bank. And that's what we're building, a digital-first national bank. We've got smaller physical branch networks, so we lean more on our CAFE network, which is in uh, 
cafes in 21 of the top 25 MSAs um, lean very heavily into our digital experiences. And um, really importantly, without a branch on every corner across the United States, uh, the role for Capital One that marketing and brand play in building this, uh, you know, national banking business is absolutely a central uh, role. So uh, we are very pleased with the growth that we're getting, the traction, the the performance uh, of, of this business. Um, and you know, the opportunity just gets bigger when we think about in the context of the combined uh, entity now joining uh, force with Discover. So these are the compelling opportunities behind our marketing growth, and we continue to feel really good about the success and the opportunities in front of us, and um, that's uh, why we are uh, leaning in very much into the marketing and um, and, and specifically with respect to the rest of the year, while why we pointed to, and of course, virtually every year at Capital One, the second half of the year has quite a bit more marketing than the first half. Uh, we pointed to uh, a pattern kind of like what we what uh, what we saw last year in terms of proportional increases in marketing. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for the color. Next question, please. Thank you. Our next question comes from Bill Karachi with Wolf Research Securities. You may proceed. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Rich and Andrew. Following up on your credit commentary, there had been an expectation among many investors that we would see peak charge-offs somewhere around the second half of this year, given the delinquency trends that you're seeing. Is that a reasonable expectation? And if so, it seems like your credit outlook has de-risked somewhat, given an improving loss trajectory, but higher reserve rate, you know, driven by qualitative factors. Is that a fair thought process? I'll just ask my follow-up uh, um, as part of this. You mentioned, Andrew, that your capital return is subject to Fed approval, given the pending acquisition. How should we think about the pace of incremental buybacks as we look ahead at the rest of the year? Thanks. Oh uh, yeah, uh, Bill. Uh, yeah, let me let me make uh, a couple comments on credit. Let me let me seize a moment uh, um, in the spirit of Henry Kissinger, who says, "I hope you have uh, questions for my answers." Um, I um, let me just uh, ask myself a, a question so I can answer it because um, it's gonna it's gonna set the table for answering uh, your question which um, you may remember last quarter, um, we, we pointed at uh, tax refund patterns and said that, that there may be a new seasonality pattern emerging. Uh, and it would be too early to call that, but it was making it a little bit, uh, things were not following as closely on a month-by-month -month basis to some pre-pandemic uh, delinquency patterns that um, our hypothesis was uh, three months ago that we're seeing uh, a, a tax refund effect. So let me just talk about that for a second, and then, Bill, I'll pull up and talk about just sort of, sort of what does this mean for sort of how I feel about where we are with respect to credit. So the, let's just talk for a second about how seasonality works. We've always seen seasonal credit patterns in our card business and our portfolio trends, um, you know, they have in generally been more, more, they've had more pronounced seasonal patterns than the industry average. I think that's because we have a higher subprime component and, and those, um, those customers are even more linked, I think, to the seasonal patterns associated with um, tax refunds. That would be our hypothesis there. Now, the second quarter tends to be the seasonal low point for delinquencies, and Q4 tends to be the seasonal high point for delinquencies. 
card losses lag relative to delinquencies. The losses tend to be seasonally lowest in the third quarter and highest in the first quarter. Now, we we believe that tax refunds, again, are, are a significant driver of these seasonal trends. And tax refund funds drive a large seasonal improvement in delinquent payments in the February-March time period, which then flows through to lower delinquencies in April and May, and then to lower charge-offs. And tax refunds also drive a seasonal uptick in our recoveries. So the, the tax code actually, uh, new tax withholding rules went into effect way back in, in 2020. They were passed in 2019, went into effect in 2020, but the pandemic and the normalization since then have kind of swamped seasonality. So we haven't really got been able to get a really good read at it of it. So we've tended to benchmark to the seasonality of, uh, of, of pre-pandemic, like 2018 and, and 2019. Um, but um, we've, we've now had several more months to look at this pattern and we're, we're seeing a pattern. Well, well let me back up. What, we, what we've done is what we call detrending of our credit metrics. So we, we in hindsight, take the, the trends uh, out of them to the best we can so we can see what the net seasonality effects are. And on a detrended basis, last year showed a, a seasonality with less amplitude on the high side and the low side than had, uh, had previously been seen pre-pandemic. We assumed that was probably again, um, a manifestation of the new behaviors going in with the new uh, tax uh, refunds. As we now have seen this uh, tax season uh, play out, the seasonality, the payment patterns have been very close to our detrended 2023 uh, line so that we, we believe that we are seeing, and it's very plausible, we are seeing a, a new seasonality. I just want to share that with uh, investors. So, um, you know, so later tax refunds and later and lower sort of uh, l lowered the, the, the seasonal improvement uh, in delinquencies um, but we think the seasonal increase in delinquency that, that we see in the back half of the year um, likely will also be less pronounced uh, going forward than it has been in the past. All of this, by the way, happens uh, in auto seasonality, but in an even faster, more concentrated uh, way. So, um, so we, what we see, we felt it was a little bit noisy last quarter when we were talking to you, we were finding each quarter things were coming in a little bit. I mean, the second derivative was still, uh, you know, doing great things, but uh, relative to our sort of close in expectations based on seasonality, things were a little bit off with the revised seasonality, what we what we see is things very nicely settling out in card credit. And, um, you know, we feel very good about the, the last couple of months that, that came in relative to that new seasonality curve. So I think settling out is the real word from here. Um, given that, you know, from to your question about peak, we're not really going to, we're not giving really forward guidance about um, declarations of peak, but you know, from a seasonal point of view, things should head down from here in Q3, um, and then uh, sort of um, uh, pop, pop up around October. October is often a month we we tend to get just a little bit of an October uh, surprise, so we'll keep an eye on that. But um, the other thing I just want to say about credit um, is 
um, our recoveries inventory is starting to rebuild, and that should be a gradual tailwind uh, to our losses over time, uh, all else being equal. And then, and then other than the economy, I think the other uh, real factor that's going to drive uh, credit performance for us and other issuers in the, in the next couple of years will be um, um, what is the size of this delayed charge-off effect from the pandemic. Thank you. And then, Bill, well, with respect to the, the de-risk uh, comment, Rich just provided a lot of color on our, our uh, view of, of losses. Um, I would just say, you know, given the accounting rules, uh, we, we forecast losses under a, a variety of scenarios and use qualitative factors for uncertainties uh, around that. And uh, I would say, therefore, like we are appropriately reserved uh, for, uh, for, for all of that. Um, with respect to your question around repurchases, I'll just note uh, our agreement with Discover doesn't prohibit us uh, from buying shares. Uh, the only restriction uh, is that we'll need to be out of the market during the S-4 uh, proxy vote period. However, we are not operating under the SCB. Um, as I said in my uh, my prepared remarks, and we laid out in the the last queue, the announcement of the uh, intention to acquire Discover did uh, constitute a material business change, and you know, therefore, uh, like we did it in this recent quarter, in the second quarter, you know, we're subject to Fed pre-approval uh, of our capital actions until the merger uh, approval uh, process has concluded, and so that's what's going to dictate the pace uh, at which we repurchase uh, until that, that process is concluded. Next question, please. Thank you. Our next question comes from Don Fandetti with Wells Fargo. You may proceed. Yes, uh, Rich, can you talk a bit about uh, how you're seeing loan growth in auto and also you know, as banks potentially come back in, are you seeing or worried about spread or yield compression on new originations? So, uh, hey, Don. Um, you know, it's an interesting thing. We we always seem, seem to zag while others zig while others zag uh, in the auto business. Um, as we discussed in the last quarter, we, we, we have an optimistic outlook uh, on the auto business. We're seeing a lot of success uh, in the auto business um, and our investments in infrastructure are also reaping a lot of benefits for us. So just on the numbers, our originations grew 21% uh, versus last year in in Q1, and the trend continues in Q2 with 18% growth uh, on the year-over-year -year, uh, quarter. And the loss performance has normalized and it's stable. Um, you know, we it, it, very importantly, we um, made uh, intervened and made an adjustment uh, for what we felt was credit score inflation that was happening during the pandemic. And so we pulled back in 22 and 23 by just, in a sense, worsening the otherwise uh, scores one would, would see under a belief that they were artificially inflated. And that enabled our vintages all through this period of time 22, 23, and all through the normalization to perform very well. Um, we like the economics of the loans were originated and um, were, um, you know, very satisfied with the performance of the overall portfolio. So, you know, when we think about the headwinds in the business, uh, interest rates remain high. And, of course, uh, that along with uh, high vehicle values continue to pressure affordability. Um, and, um, you know, auto uh, used car prices, which are still 
high relative to historical standards. Uh, you know, they they are probably in a position to gradually be uh, coming down. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. For a long time, we were concerned about uh, the margins in the business because uh, competitors had not uh, passed through higher interest rates into the uh, cost of the auto loans. We pulled back uh, quite a bit, John, as you remember, during that period of time. Uh, we have seen uh, those margins uh, basically return uh, to where they were. So um, I think that's a, a pretty good um, uh, sign there. So all things considered, with a with a with a watchful eye on uh, used car values, uh, we are uh, seeing enhanced opportunities in the auto business with margins that. Um, you know, have um, a good resilience uh, to them and quite a bit improved relative to the period where we were raising uh, the alarm bells a bit about um, what um, was happening to the, the effective um, resilience in that business. Thank you. Thanks. Next Thank question, you. please. And our final question this evening comes from the line of Moshi Orenbach with TD Cowan. You may proceed. Great, thanks. Um, when when you talked about the increase in the reserve rate, you know, not the dollars of the reserve, not the Walmart piece, but the reserve rate itself. Uh, Andrew, you didn't mention like mix of receivables. You know, is is it has there been any shift? You know, towards uh, you know mass market or subprime from super prime within the card business? Not in any material way that would have a, a significant impact on the uh, the allowance, Moshe. Got it. Okay. I mean, and just as a follow-up, Rich, um, you know, given what's happened with Walmart and the pending Discover acquisition, could you talk a little about your thoughts on, on you know, the partner or private label business, you know, kind of in the current environment? Like, you know, what are your thoughts now in terms of your existing contracts and, you know, their tendency to, to want to, uh, you know, to get new ones? Like, any, any thoughts on that in this environment? Uh, so, uh, thank you. I, I think the... Well, the Walmart uh, partnership uh, is a very, was a very unique one that I think, um, you know, there's not a lot to extrapolate to other partners on that. Um, I think we've ended up in a situation there where, you know, we, we you know, it, w the loss share was a very uh, good thing. So we're going to be carrying around, you know, uh, loss rates that are... Um, you know, something on the order of 40 basis points uh, higher on our portfolio for that. So, um, you know, we'll have to just make sure we all uh, see that. But, but we've got the, you know, the full economics on the business. Increasingly, that portfolio, you know, the portfolio we inherited is now very seasoned and the rest of it is the portfolio we ourselves originated. So, uh, you know, we know it well. And I think that, um, you know, we feel uh, very good about uh, that. So uh, the partnership uh, business is a very partner by partner business. I think where people get into trouble is uh, feeling they've got to drive to a certain scale. We all know scale matters in the credit card business and scale matters in the partnership business. But here's the thing. We have certainly learned over time how um, – unique uh, or how how um, individual different partnerships uh, are and and uh, we've seen great ones we've seen not so great ones uh, here's Moshe what we if I pull up on the patterns of what we uh, most look for it's first of all a healthy franchise a, a company that is itself healthy um, and um, that's 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 certainly a good sign. Now, the credit card business does have a pretty good uh, default structure whereby if a partner runs into trouble and can't continue, we 
inherit uh, the the portfolio, which now Walmart, of course, is a very strong company, but we're here's an example of inheriting a portfolio um, where I think you know things are going to continue very successfully uh, there. But the other thing that we really look for is what is the reason that the partner um, is driving this um, uh, either co-brand or private label business? Is it to, is, is the, on one end of a continuum is it's the sheer quest for profits. And on the other end of the continuum, it is having the card partnership at the, as a centerpiece in driving a franchise and the behaviors that a partner has the incentives that get baked into into programs they tend to be very driven by where on that continuum uh, one is we've walked away from a lot of opportunities over the years where um, things were just too focused on the the card partnership as sort of the the means to drive profit for the, the partner at, at more so than a way to really build a franchise. But um, those are some of the patterns. There are always exceptions to every rules, every rule. But um, uh, so we're still um, very much a believer in the card partnership b- business. But the key is we're going to be selective and um, and never, um, you know, knowing that it's an auction-based business, that's the other thing. One has to really be willing to walk away uh, when the price isn't right. So um, with that, uh, those are my thoughts, uh, Moshe. Thank you, Rich. And thanks, everyone, for joining us on the conference call today. Thank you for your continuing interest in Capital One. Have a great evening. Thank you. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.